So such a way, you know, I had my life starting with Morantz, you know, coming from pioneer background and completely different. And then I was able to experience you know, so many wonderful things you know, with Morantz, learning <coughs> everything. And that was the landscape to me. You all go to this special guest pass, right? And then over there, I'm wearing red jacket because it's ruby, 40 years anniversary. Why am I not doing it today? I'm still in this red, but I'm wearing gold. What is gold? 50 years. So I'm already the way yeah, to the 50 years. <laughs> anyway, 40 years sounding pretty long, isn't it? But for me, it's just like 15 years. Because I've been very lucky yeah, to be part of a very interesting project in, yeah, so many times. But I haven't spoken how I entered to Morantz, how it started, and then early period, what I was doing. So today I'm going to tell you how it started, and how I went into the Morantz organization, and what was my feeling about Morantz in that time. It was 1977 not 78. So 41 years ago, Marantz Europe, which was based in Brussels in that time, they contacted me. And then I went there and they said, well, we'd like to have you because we have relationship with the Japanese manufacturer. But we don't have anybody who speaks Japanese and understand the business and also you know, engineering. We need such a person. Then someone must have recommended me to them. So I said, yeah, that's fine. So I gave my condition, everything to Marantio, personal manager. She looked at me. And then my paper indicated what I want for the income. Mr. Ishiwata, sorry, we can't afford you. <laughs> <laughs> that was her answer. I said, uh uh uh, I'm not going to bargain myself. No way. So I left. I completely forgot about it. A few months later, Early 1978, they called me back. We can't afford you, but our Japanese organization, they still want you. <laughs> they will pay <laughs> the amount you want. So that's okay. So let's talk. So I went there and met Japanese gentleman. And then discussed everything, and it seems it went okay. And they said, we will talk in Japan and come back to me. I said, okay, no problem. They came back in one week. Okay, you were hired. That's what they said. <laughs> but now, you have to come to Japan for three months for training. I said, okay, no problem. I'll be there. And they sent me the ticket. So, went off. But my idea about Morant, of course, I knew so we Morant's product, because in high school time, I encountered Model 7, Model 9, and I was so impressed. But then I knew they've been sold, and Superscope bought it. Yeah? Exactly. And then 
they went to Japan, and they made this Marantz Japan ink, which was former standard radio. Does anybody know what the standard radio was? They had two things. One was for radio communication unit, for yeah, amateur, yeah, for the uh, 3.5 meg and 7 meg yeah, communication. Yeah, so that was the equipment they were producing. And 60% of their <coughs> business was similar to Sony, like portable radio and so on. So in my feeling, they don't know anything about the hi fi. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so but now they become a part of big Marantz brand. So I was wondering so what it was. No, so I went I went to Japan and then on the first two weeks I have to be in the engineering group for the amplifier and the receiver. For me it was quite shocking discovering super scope standard there. It was amazingly high standard, which for normal Japanese, because the my time, I came from Pioneer originally. And then, see, in that time, Pioneer came with Sansui. Those are the three most important hi-fi brands. Compared to those three Japanese brands, Super scope set it up, but incredible standard. I was really so shocked. But they did control every production and followed AQL, American Military Quality Control System, AQL. And not just only for the first production, for every production. And then when they ship those products, to the United States and also to Europe, they did the incoming inspection in America and the incoming inspection in Europe. And they were following AQL standard on the highest possible way. I was really impressed how they did. And then they told me another standard we have we have so-called true power condition. What do you mean with true power? They said, on every amplification we make, receiver or amplifier, minimum at 4 ohm had to deliver 25% more than 8 ohm for 100% product, production and everything. And Amplifier, receiver, you have so many parameters, amplifier, <coughs> power, distortion, <coughs> signal to noise, everything. All those <laughs> announced specification is usually champion specification, isn't it? On the, all those Japanese companies. Superscope, <coughs> they said, our standard, huh? we check every unit. Like we did it in quality. 75% must fulfill all parameters. I was really shocked. And they were actually controlling all those details. When they are producing the product, and when they ship it to the Europe and to America, the local quality control. The basic reason why we hired you, we want you huh, to find it out what is going on. Especially with the, these receiver and amplifier, huh, they have a lot of problems. Huh. So I said, okay. And then I was really so surprised how they set it up such a high standard for the specification. But it was, for me, biggest support. That's the difference between Marantz and the rest. It is not the same as all other Japanese companies. 
when they were developing amplifier standards they had, they feed tone burst signal on the power amp. They bring it in the clipping level. Yeah. And then uh, they increase it. 6 dB. Yeah? Clipping it. Eh? From then they increase 6 dB. And then they keep running for three days. Yeah. And amplifier, amplifier may not break. That's the standard they set it up. And this load was not resistive load. They had uh, plus minus 60 degree phase shift, mm -hmm. 30 hertz. It was a crazy test. Not one Japanese company was doing such a test. And that was the quality of the standard. They were having it in the Marant. I was so shocked. I said, wow, no? it's a quite a different. So I asked them, how did you start it with standard radio? Because you guys, they, you didn't have any knowledge or even experience on those hi-fi. Yes, we had to get American engineers, educators, and then they told from the beginning in the past five years, Japanese were not allowed to design anything. They were just studying Marant's way of designing a Do you know some of you, maybe, you know, Mr. Like, uh, Mr. Bongiorno, yeah, who was the fantastic amplifier designer? Yeah, he, he was part of the, the super school. And yeah, he set it up all those uh, quality standards together with Mr. Goldberg yeah, of the quality control. And they, they set it to a really high standard. I was really surprised. Like it did in you know, FM, how they have set it up. Yeah. Sensitivity, yeah, also distortion, and how you measure it was a very precise. Yeah. And then, on the quality control, how has to be done. I learned so much from them. Hmm? How they did all those incredible tests for the quality. So they were so keen on keeping quality high. So that was my first education when I went into Murant. Then, of course, first two weeks, amplifier and receiver. Then followed by tape recorder, cassette deck in that time. Because they had their own mechanism, cassette deck, producing it, mechanism themselves, and then making cassette deck as well. They also have a very specific way of designing huh? cassette deck and also the way of measuring. And also the mechanism they were doing, it was very interesting. But then I discovered, maybe I told you, yeah, in the time of a pioneer, I did the open deal. Yeah. So I knew how to test tape transport and so on. And then back tension, so supply relief yeah, tension, yeah, to keep tape against the head, it's so damn important. In their cassette mechanism, this was weak. Yeah. So I pointed out, <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, you have all those wonderful standards, yeah, but yeah, what we can do to increase back tension in, in such a way. And, and you know, I enjoyed the second week working on such a product directory. So I spent yeah, three months learning about Morant, yeah, and then and back to Europe. Then I went into the, this factory in Belgium. Morant had a factory in Belgium for the speakers. That's where they did incoming inspection as well. 
And then I saw how the this incoming inspection is done. And they do every day, yeah, because so many, yeah, they have to do the sampling based on AQL standard. And so they have to test all the parameters. It's a lot of work. So every day from in the morning till evening, they are doing this thing. And they were rejecting. So I had to sit on this bench of testing. Rejected one, I tested. Yeah? Ninety percent was within the specification of Japan. What I found it out was the way measuring huh? specification was wrong. Well, not wrong, but they didn't know. Now, for example, when they are testing FM, you have signal straight meter. Yeah? Then you tune it in the maximum. Then for fine tune, you have yeah, center tuning meter. And then yeah, they, what they do, they bring it to the center. But as you know, unfortunately, those IF circuit is not symmetrical. Yeah? So if you place tuning to the center, you won't get always the lowest distortion. Yeah? But of course, those people who are sitting in the production, yeah, or the, this, the quality control line, yeah, they do not have those knowledge. So they were just adjusting to the center, and then distortion figures are too high. So they rejected. So first, one year, I was sitting in this quality control line every day, and then checking all rejected unit. Report back to Japan, and then explain those errors made by the people who test them. You know? And then, all of a sudden, communication with Japan become much, much better. So they were quite happy with what I started to do. So that was my first job, huh? to do solving the problem of misunderstanding, I would say, between Japanese engineering group and European quality department. And they were doubting each other. That was their problem. It was not product issue at all. And I was quite happy working with such a because I learned so much by doing this thing. That was my first experience with Murant. And I enjoy it very much. Because by doing this, you learn so much. And as I said on this place, it was speaker factory. And as you know, in Europe, they prefer European sounding speakers. Morant, yeah. they have only American design, American sounding speakers. And they were looking for European design. Yeah. And then they found it out, I was involved in the time of the pioneer, communicating with Japan, with the European requirement for the speakers. And I did help Japanese engineering group on the speakers. So I did some development with them. Morant Europe, they found it out what I was doing. So, can you do the speaker development for us? So on top of this quality, things, then I started to do the European speaker development. So that uh, the first time mm. I started to involve myself in the Marant product directly, developing it. So 79. Yeah. See, so then I made uh, quite a number of speakers for them. And you know, it's like LD50 and the other yeah. sort of, uh, time. Actually, in that time, Marantz Europe 
was producing between 160 to 260,000 speakers a year. Can you imagine that? And the Marantz brand, mm -hmm. and they were selling them. So I started to do the speakers, and then I started to listen to the speakers. Then I noticed sound of amplifier was not really what I remember. Marantz amplifier sound, like Model 7 and Model 9. See? So then I started to communicate with Japan and go into yeah, details of those yeah, design and so on. So that's the way yeah, I started to involve myself yeah, into the product. See? Then Philips happened. Yeah? Because compact disc came in in the early 80s. And that changed our life completely, including mine. Mm. As you know, compact disc <coughs> was revolution in a way in the, our industry. But majority of audio files, they didn't like compact disc. <laughs> yeah. Actually, we all knew specification of the compact disc standard. Was not really good enough for high level. But what we had to think was, you know, this is coming from Philip and Sony. We had to set the standard, which this standard allows such a big company to be able to come up with product yeah, within a few years, very reasonable price. Yeah? Because if you set too high, yeah, imagine like a 192K, yeah, a 24-bit in that time, no way. You see? <coughs> Not even 16. <laughs> so the, the, so that's the reason why they set it down. Yeah, such a standard. For Mr. Average, it was good enough mm -hmm. specification. And that's the way yeah, it was defined. Yeah. And of course, we didn't know anything, including myself. I didn't know anything about digital audio at all. I learned so much from Philips. Such a way, yeah. I always gained knowledge from doing something. And that's already made such a big difference in my life. Yeah. That's also the reason why these 40 years, I don't feel it so long. Yeah. It's always something new, something interesting. Because yeah. you know, when Marantz Japan, yeah had to deal with people from Philips. All Japanese engineers, they didn't know English at all. So how are we yeah, going to communicate? Me. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, for, for, for them, it also it was a quite an easy solution. Yeah? But for me, it's just knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. Yeah? Learned so much by doing these things. And then also, that was the period. So we met. He called me. That was the time when, do you know, he tried to come up with a product called Lineage. Yeah? And they could not finish that project because of the fact actual electronics design was done by Junkao. Cosmetic design was done by solving that. You ask those two to come up with a preamplifier and a power amplifier. Yeah? Yeah, they can come with wonderful concept, wonderful design. <coughs> but one commercial guy in this, yeah, he set the standard preamp must go out at $1,500. 
far I'm at two thousand dollar. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> you don't ask John Carl or so, yeah? Designing something for those price points. So John Carl and so this design. Then they costed calculation more than double. <laughs> and then they said, holy shit, what are we going to do? And then they contacted Eindhoven, me. Now we got this design. We have to reduce the cost by half. <laughs> Can you help us? <laughs> that was my first contact with Sol <laughs> Now, Anyway, this project yeah, didn't happen. Yeah. But Sol said, you know, can, with the tube and the mono LP, stereo LP, I have done almost everything. But yeah, now it's your time to do something with the CD. I said, well, that's not fair, I said. <laughs> <laughs> but I said, okay, I'll try my utmost. But in a way, yeah, again, yeah, if you ask reputation of Morantz today, a lot of people think Morantz is a CD specialist, isn't it? <laughs> not just an amplifier. No. So I think it's... No, in a way, came out that way as well. So such a way, you know, I had my life starting with Murant, yeah, coming from pioneer background and completely different. And then I was able to experience you know, so many wonderful things yeah, with Murant, learning <coughs> everything. And that what Murant gave to me. Yeah. And I, of course, tried in my own way yeah, to give it back yeah, as much as I personally could do. And yes, 40 years, it's a long, long time. But no, it's a wonderful time I have. So I really enjoyed so much with this period. So no, I have no regrets whatsoever. No. And you know no, from the time how uh, CD started, then yeah, KI signature CD, et cetera, et cetera, those. Yeah. So you all know what happened after with my life, it's Murant. Yeah. But I haven't talked about how I went into the Murant and how I learned so much yeah, from the Murant program. So today, on this occasion, I wanted you all to know huh, how I started with Murant. Yeah. I hope it was interesting. <laughs> yeah, very much. Yeah. Yeah. See, as I said, it's in this story I wasn't told to anybody before. Yeah. So, yeah. and hopefully you enjoyed it a little bit. <laughs>